In 2017, a guy called Alex Honold climbed El Capitan in Yosemite Park. It's like 914 meters. It's like almost a kilometer of vertical climbing. And what was most remarkable about that climb was that he did it with no ropes, no harness. And if, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a documentary called Free Solo and it's absolutely breathtaking, but it's also like really, really nerve wracking because you know that as he's climbing, like one false move, one slip, even just one like bird coming out of like a crack in the rock could see him plunging like hundreds of meters down to earth. Think about the crew filming it. They know that just one errant drone could just like take him out and uh, see him plunging to his death. I wonder if this is what it feels for some of you right now as you're following Jesus. Just feels so precarious. Maybe it's because you're in a workplace where the values are so far away from what you have come to believe that you're worried that like one false move and you might be out of that job. Maybe it's because for you, your whole family mock you for being a Christian because they have nothing to do with it. Maybe your whole family is a completely different religion and you're worried that if they really knew what you believed about Jesus, that actually they might cut you off completely. Maybe for you it's a classroom situation at uni or at school where just what is being taught feels like it's dismantling your beliefs. I just want you to take that picture of that guy hanging on that rock face. Because it doesn't matter whether you're uh, really experienced or you're really a beginner in climbing. There's like one principle that they always want to follow. And that is that um, you always keep three, uh, three touch points with the, with the rock face at all times. You only ever move like one hand or one foot at a time. And as we dive into Acts chapter 4 today, we're going to look at the very first moments of persecution and opposition of the church. And as we read this text, I want you to see three anchor points, like three things that these guys held to that helped them navigate that time. And what I hope is that you're going to take these anchors and when you're in a moment of opposition, when you're in a moment where you feel like you're clinging on, that you'll begin to know what, you're, what, what to hold on to. And I can't promise you that you're going to keep your job. I can't promise you that you're going to be like best mates with everyone. In fact, that's almost likely not to happen, almost certain not to happen. But I can tell you that I think these, these anchors will help you navigate that time. So would you turn with me if you've got a Bible with you? We're going to go to Acts chapter 4, and I'm just going to read it. It's quite a long passage. We're just going to go through it right now. It says this, the, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So remember a couple of weeks ago, Jerem took us through it and, and this idea that Peter and John have healed this guy in the temple courts and, um, and the people are like, whoa, you've done something amazing. And they're like, no, 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 this was Jesus. Okay, and now the Sadducees and the, and the, and the captain of the temple guard are coming up because they're not happy. They were greatly disturbed, verse 2, because the apostles are teaching the people because I can't even read today, because the apostles are teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem, and as the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, 
There was nothing they could say, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further, we must warn them not to speak any longer in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Now one of the funniest verses in the Bible. For the man who had been miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Now, I just, I need to pause right now. Because I do represent, only just, but I do represent that category of people just over 40 and up. And what are we trying to say? That we need more power to heal people over 40? Like, is this something that happens at the moment? Like, I know I'm not 21 anymore, but I'm offended at that. Uh, Anyway, should we move on? Let's move on. And so imagine the scene, right? These guys are in the temple courts and suddenly the chief priests, uh, suddenly the Sadducees uh, come up. The Sadducees were like religious elite. They were aristocracy. They were the majority of the Jewish rulers. And they were famous because uh, they did not believe in bodily resurrection. And Peter and John's message that Jesus has been raised offends their beliefs. But also the, the um, captain of the temple guard, he's like the local police, okay? He's, he's making sure there's order. And, and him and the Sadducees, they're pretty, pretty cozy with the Romans. And, and so they don't want any sort of change in the status quo. It's probably good for their wealth. It's good for their status. And, and, and so they don't want any change there. So when Peter and John start talking about this Messiah, this promised ruler over Israel that, that God has, has sent, they, these Sadducees and, 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 and this local police, they don't like it because it offends their values. It, it could change the status quo so they're not happy. And what is more, um, Peter and John have come into the temple courts to do this. And so it's like, we'd be fine if you sort of proclaim this message in your own home, but you've just come into the place that we're responsible for and you're spreading those things here. Can we relate to that? That it's like, you keep your Christian beliefs at home. Don't come into the public square. Don't bring it into this relationship. Don't try and give me a message that this maybe isn't in line with my beliefs or maybe that my values are wrong or maybe what I love is not quite right. Like, don't bring that message here. And so if, 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 if the situation for them was similar to the situation for us, then I think the anchor points that they found are the anchor points that can be ours two. And so I want you to see what they are. Number one, it's one name. One name. This passage, if you were listening, is full of the word name, name, name. It's what they're told to stop doing. It's what they're quizzed about right at the outset. The key verse in here is verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name by which we must be saved. So what does it mean to speak in the name of Jesus? This is a pretty tricky one because it's not clearly defined. But if you think Peter and John have been talking before this in chapter 3, and now they're talking in chapter 4. And so if we have a little look, I reckon we can work it out for ourselves. First of all, I think to speak in the name of Jesus is to speak about his works. This passage is littered with evidence that Jesus died and he rose again. He rose or was raised from the dead. Secondly, to speak in the name of Jesus is to speak about his person, who he is. They're proclaiming a message about Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, God's promised rescuer, saviour, deliverer, ruler over Israel. Thirdly, to speak in the name of Jesus is to speak about his authority. Just notice this for a moment, okay? If you go to verse 9, it says, um, if we're being asked to, uh, called to account today for this act of kindness shown uh, for the man who was healed and are being asked how he was healed, okay? Notice that verse. Notice that word. And then when you go to verse 12, it says, there's one name given uh, under heaven, given to mankind, by which we must be saved. I've un- underlined both of them, okay? Because in the Greek, it's the same word, sozo. And what I think Peter is saying here is that if, Pete, if Jesus has the authority to heal you on the outside, he has the authority to heal you on the inside. If he can deliver this man from physical sickness, he can heal this man, uh, deliver this man from spiritual sickness. 
What, what he's saying is this healing is a sign that Jesus can forgive you of your sin and wash you clean. To speak in the name of Jesus is to speak that Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. And finally, to speak in the name of Jesus is to speak of the response that is necessary. In uh, chapter 3 verse 19 it says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. It's not just good enough to hear about Jesus. It's not just good enough to know, okay, I, I, I know that they believed he's the Messiah and he rose from the dead and he can forgive sins. It has to be received. You've got to repent. You've got to turn from your ways and turn to him and, and, and respond to him and follow him. And I just wonder if it's this part that maybe as Christians we're, obvious, we're, we're, we're often poor at. That actually calling people for a response. Maybe we've got a little bit comfortable in, in, in helping people understand the message of Jesus, but not actually maybe stepping across the line and saying, and what's your response? I was talking to a friend of mine um, yesterday. He's just been with a church in Africa. And he said to me, Simon, they just trust the gospel. <laughs> they just keep it really simple and they trust the gospel message to change lives. You see, when we get a little bit comfortable just sort of gently introducing the name of Jesus and, and sort of having a bit of a conversation about it, that can be great relationally. But we're at risk sometimes of just sort of including Jesus in the pantheon of ideas for people. We have to come to a place and we, we need the wisdom to know the moment. To say, can I just ask you, has anybody ever shared the gospel with you? And then to ask, and, and is there any reason why you wouldn't want to give your life to Jesus and tell him you believe in him right now? That sort of step in a relationship takes great courage. And it's why we're going to move on to this next um, next anchor and it's that not just one name but their second anchor their second sort of handhold on the wall was one power notice in verse 8 but it says Peter filled with the spirit spoke to them he's not speaking under his own enabling his own empowering he's, uh, he's speaking under the empowering of the Holy Spirit but what's most remarkable about this moment is that just two months earlier, Peter had, Peter, Peter had been around the same group of people. Jesus has been wrongly arrested and he was, he was being tried and Peter was nearby. But he was so petrified of these guys knowing that he was caught up with Jesus, that he denies Jesus, not just once, not twice, but three times. He was petrified and he deserted Jesus at his, most, uh, his darkest hour, his time of greatest need. And yet now he stands up in front of that same group of people and suddenly there's a boldness about him. See, something's changed. He's seen Jesus raised from the dead. The Spirit of God has come upon him and now he's able to speak up. So much so that these guys take notice of the courage that it took to say those things. This courage came from the Holy Spirit. But I just wonder if we sort of gloss over this text and sort of like bring it into some sort of abstract realm, like, oh, they, they received the Holy Spirit and they just sort of floated through this situation. I want to suggest that maybe they were in this situation empowered by the Holy Spirit, but maybe shaking in their boots still a little bit. See, I think we misunderstand the word courage. You think of a, a bike rider coming down a slope and, and, and jumping off a huge jump. You would say, that's courage. But, but when you listen to them talk about these sorts of stunts that they do, they're shaking at the top. They're fearful because they know what could happen if it goes wrong. Courage is therefore not, um, not the, the ease with which we do something, but the willingness to do something when there's every reason why we shouldn't. And for Peter and John in this moment, their lives are potentially on the line. Certainly their freedom is on the line. I don't suppose they're in this moment sort of like footloose and fancy free. But empowered by the Spirit, they have a willingness to share Jesus no matter what the consequences are. And so courage isn't comfort. It's the ability, ability to keep going when there's every reason why you shouldn't. And I just wonder for you right now, what is that situation, what's that relationship where you desperately need courage? so that you can have the bravery, the willingness to speak about Jesus. Well, the third thing that I want you to see is that they came under one authority, 
one authority. That wonderful uh, verse 19, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him, you be the judge. In other words, who should we obey? Like even the leaders themselves would have known the answer to this question. It's obvious, isn't it? It's the sort of question that comes from spending time with Jesus. It's the sort of question that comes from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. How do we know this? Because you watch Jesus when he's confronted in his life in ministry. He comes up with the simplest, most profound, most penetrating questions that really unearth the, the heart of the matter. That, that, that these leaders in this moment were more interested in... Um, in, in being obeyed than they were in these people obeying God. Have you ever become, have you ever noticed how easily we can become just so deeply engrossed in, in, in the here and now? When I was at school, I was petrified of the headmaster's office. Now, I wasn't petrified enough to never go there. Um, I was there regularly. It was worse because my mum worked in the school and I'd be like standing outside his office waiting to go in. My mum would walk past and I'm like, oh no. Like, so it didn't, it didn't really cure me, but I just hated going there. But there comes a moment where you sort of step back and go, and it's just the school. Like he doesn't really have that much authority. Like he can't actually do that stuff. Like he can't do anything really bad to me. And I feel like it might be helpful for us to just step back from the context of the world a little bit and go, actually, there is no authority anywhere on earth, even the leader of the greatest superpower the world has ever known, comes under the authority of Jesus. And I feel like it can be helpful for us just to step back a little bit and go, huh, it doesn't matter what the, what the authority is. Jesus is greater. You know, I wonder what authority you're at risk of bowing the knee to right now. I wonder what pressure is going on in your world that you're just um, at risk of yielding to. Is it a boss? Is it peer pressure in your workplace? Is it public opinion? Is it what your friends will think? Is it the government even? Jesus is far above and we're called under one authority to obey him. I just think it's helpful for us to step back sometimes and just take stock like that. Which is right to obey, the authority in front of me or the authority of heaven? I think it's helpful to acknowledge that we have to come under the authority of Jesus, but that doesn't give us license to be an idiot. I'm just going to put it out there. Notice Peter here, he says, he starts his speech with rulers and authorities. Um, scholars tell us this is just an uber um, respectful way of referring to the people in front of him. And he doesn't come in like all guns blazing. Notice when they're challenged, he asks a question. Like questions are so wonderfully disarming just like Jesus did. It reminds me of a verse in Colossians. It says this, Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, when we think of sharing Jesus, we don't have to come in with like a uh, just load it up to the teeth with gospel ammunition. Okay, it says seasoned with salt. We'd have to like present a plate of salt just with this little grace garnish. Like nobody wants that plate of food, right? It's about coming into a conversation with love and with compassion and with grace, but then sprinkling it with questions, sprinkling it with stories and testimonies of God's greatness and power in your life, sprinkling it maybe with just a little hint of a different perspective sometimes that you have received from the gospel. We're to, we're to sprinkle every conversation with salt. And so as you think about a tricky situation you've got right now, I just wonder, maybe you want to think about this. What would be a question that you could ask that might invite further conversation, invite that person in front of you to open up on a deeper level? I mean, these are our three anchors. These are the things we cling on to. But I also want you to see, I don't want you to miss that right in the middle of this passage, there's hope. And that's where we're going to go, to chapter 4, verse 3. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Just imagine if that happened in our church today. 
Just like they seized people and they put them in jail. We'd be like, oh no, everything's gone wrong. This is terrible. But notice, you, know, you don't have to take a breath before you get to the next verse. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. It's instant. They're arrested, they're put into jail, and suddenly the church is at 5,000 men. It was like 3,000 a minute ago. Now it's 5,000 men, which means it's probably even bigger still. It is miraculous. The Jews hated Jesus. They just wanted anything to get rid of him, and they killed him. Imagine their surprise when three days later, God raises him to life again. And so when the message of him starts going out and 3,000 believe, they're like, how do we get rid of this guy? How do we get rid of his followers? I know when they start speaking about him, let's just arrest them. Let's put them in jail. And what happens? There's 5,000 straight away. This is just the way God works. If you look through the story of Scripture, it happened with Pharaoh. He tried to get rid of God's people, and they just multiplied, so they like covered the whole area of Goshen. Like Persecution of the church is just futile. Because God is the one who is able in that situation to make it grow. I asked a friend of mine to draw me a picture. This is just what came to mind when I thought about this, okay? Imagine you're like mowing the grass and you're, you know, it's, it's a bit crazy, but you mow the grass and you just try and cut it down to the size and you look behind you and it's like 10 times the height that it was before. And I feel like this is a picture of what happens. Like the enemies of God tried to destroy the church, tried to cut it down to size. And it's like they're just going after and if they just looked over their shoulder, they realize this is just multiplying. It's like when you persecute the church, you're just playing into God's hands. This is just how he acts. It makes me wonder, have we just become a little bit comfortable, church? Have we just tried to avoid opposition? Have we tried to just keep our heads down and just hope that nobody really ever asks us about what we believe in Jesus? We just want to navigate opposition by just avoiding it. And I wonder just what would happen if we allowed the Spirit of God to give, us an, to give us the courage to share and discuss and reach out with the name of Jesus and be bold enough to call people to response. And yes, that might lose us some friends. Yes, that might become difficult at times. Yes, there might be positions in our society that you are no longer welcome to occupy because of how unpalatable it is of what you, about what you believe. But I just wonder in that situation what God might do. And maybe the growth in the church that we have been crying out for for so long will come because of God is able to use persecution as his way of growing the church. And so church, be of good courage. If you're facing a situation right now that's just so challenging, it's like I just, I want to check out. Hold to these anchors. We believe in one name. We're empowered by one spirit. And we trust in one authority, the name of Jesus. And trust that even if the worst happens and you are cut off or you lose friends or whatever happens, know that God is using that very thing to build his church. Oh Lord, we just pray for people today who desperately need the encouragement of your spirit Lord, we pray that we as a church would be brave, that we wouldn't seek comfort, that we wouldn't seek ease, but that we would trust you. Trust you in the difficulty. Trust you when it's hard. Trust the message of the name of Jesus and the gospel that changes lives. And I just pray for anybody right now that desperately needs a, a word of encouragement. Lord, I pray that you'd give that to them right now by your spirit. And there would be a boldness that comes about us. And we pray that even if opposition gets bad for us, Lord God, that we would rejoice in that moment and that you would cause an incredible increase for the glory of your name. We pray this in your name. Amen.